Now, we are agilists, which means we believe in time boxing. So we like to start on time and end on time, or at least that's usually the goal, whether we actually achieve it every single meeting, which we definitely do not. But while we're just waiting for the rest of the attendees to join us, I'd like to take a moment to thank you, welcome you all, and just do a quick round of introductions to all of the, uh, to the two other panelists who will be joining us for this webinar to talk through the launch of the 2021 Business Agility Report. So for those who don't know me, my name is Evan Laybourne. For my sins, I am the CEO and the co-founder of the Business Agility Institute. And uh, I think most of you know who we are. We are a global professional association to champion and drive new ways of working, new ways of being, new ways of thinking when it comes to organizations. And I am happily joined by the very, very busy, very, very courageous Sally Alata. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Evan. So excited to be here. I love this. And uh, this report, honestly, is really exciting compared to even the, the other reports that we've had. So I'm looking forward to, to, to doing this with you today and, uh, and with you as well, Martin. Thanks, Sally. And yeah, um, we'll be taking good you through the data and a few of the interesting points that have come through from this year's findings. Fantastic. So um, please feel free. There's going to be plenty of time for Q&A and conversation. So please, as you have questions, add them to the Q&A or add them to the chat. Either way will work. Um, uh, we'll have at least half an hour to answer any questions that you've got. Um, if you registered for this webinar, uh, well, more than about three hours ago, you would have received a copy of the Business Agility Report, uh, which is now live. So I hope you've had a chance to um, have a, I hope you've had a chance to read it and had a chance to consume and understand what is different. So I'm gonna take a couple of minutes and just set some context and provide a little bit of background information. Most of you are familiar with the concepts of business agility. But to make sure we're all on the same page, let me share with you what we will define as the definitions of business agility, right? which is a set of organizational capabilities and behaviors and ways of working. And that's important. Business agility isn't a set of practices. It's not a framework. In fact, there is no framework or it's very difficult to create frameworks for business agility. I could explain why, but that's an entire different webinar in its own right. Uh, that affords your business the flexibility, the freedom, and the resilience to achieve its purpose. So what does that mean? It means that we are creating an organization that is purpose-driven, customer-centric. And let's be honest, for most of you, your purpose is to serve your customer, not to make money. There's a great quote by Frederick Laloux, profit is like the air. We do not live to breathe. Uh, we do not, we do, yeah. profit is like the air. We do not live to breathe, but we do need to breathe in order to live. Sorry, that was a bit of a tongue twister. Um, for your organizations, being purpose-driven, focusing on your customer is your raison d'etre. It's why you exist. And COVID-19 has proven many things, but what it is proven beyond a shadow of a doubt is that customer-centric organizations are the ones that are more resilient in the face of disruption. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. The last six words, no matter what the future brings. This is probably the key to business agility. I don't know what the future is going to hold. None of us predicted COVID-19. Um, none of us predicted the global financial crisis in 2008. None of us predicted Arab Spring. Uh, these things impacted our, all, ourselves and our organizations in ways that we don't, in, in some days, in some ways, we're still trying to figure out what that impact was and what it means. So when we talk about no matter what the future brings, what we're talking about is the ability to respond, not to react, not to jump around frantically because something's happened that you weren't prepared for. It's about the ability to respond 
to create a strategic plan that can change on a daily basis. It's about creating empowerment in your teams so that they're listening and talking to the customers so that you have those feedback loops built into the system naturally so that when something changes, and let's be honest, COVID-19, right, it's not the last disruption that's going to hit your industry, our industry. It will, something will happen again. I don't know when, you don't know when. All you can do is have the preparedness to be able to respond no matter what the future brings. And it's in this environment that we are very, very proud to launch the 2021 Business Agility Report. This was, uh, it, this is the, the fourth report, hang on, I believe this is the fourth report, correct me if it, it might, I'm pretty sure it's the fourth report that we've done. Yes, it's the fourth, correct, I got it right. So this is the fourth report that we've done that looks at the state of business agility around the world, the adoption, the benefits, the challenges. Sally and Martin will actually spend some time going into what, uh, into what we've learned in the report. But what I wanna do is just take another moment and just at a very high level, articulate two key things. One, it would be foolish of us to ignore the impact of COVID-19 on business agility around the world. And obviously we can't ignore it. Has business agility impacted organizational business agility transformations? Yes. Has business agility impacted an organization's ability to respond to COVID-19? Also, yes. And the good news is both trends are positive. Right? We know again, from the responses that we have, that organizations who invested in business agility transformation feel more prepared, more able in, to adapt to, again, whatever the future brought. They were able to adapt to COVID-19. And think of it like going to the gym, something that I definitely don't do often enough. Uh, you go to the gym, you exercise your muscles. Right? You don't exercise your muscles because you need to do something. You exercise your muscles to get fit. You build up strength, you build up stamina, you build up fitness. Once you have strength, once you are fit, you have more capabilities. The muscles is your business agility, the domains of business agility. With, if you've been to the business agility gym, your organization has that those new capabilities to adapt to whatever the future brings. And that's what's happening here in a COVID environment where companies who practiced, who have been adopting business agility were ready. They know how to do adaptive strategy. They weren't prepared for something the scale of COVID-19, nobody was, but they had enough preparedness to actually use that, use those new muscles to adapt and thrive in uncertainty. So the Business Agility Report, as I said, which most of you I think have got a copy of now, highlights the benefits and the challenges that organizations have found. I'd like to take a moment now to pass on to Sally Alata, who's gonna share a little bit more about the key predictive indicators, as well as a little bit around what are some of the complementary behaviors and learnings that we have? Sally? Thank you very much, Evan. Uh, you know, Evan asked me and said, what is gonna be your key message from this report? Uh, what do you wanna share with people is the key, the big theme. And, and all I could think about is business agility is real. It's here, it's not going away. And we all just got a boot camp in business agility. Let's talk about that business agility gym. We just went through it. <laughs> we just had like a really rough boot camp with COVID. But I actually think it accelerated. So I don't think I know now because of the reports. So that's the beautiful thing. You don't have to think anymore. You now know uh, that COVID accelerated the maturity towards business agility. And, and for me, you know, as I work with so many executives that are trying to transform, I really reflected on those, um, the three predictors of business agility and like how real they are right now. So if you've read the report, you know what they are. I might quiz you on them, but here I won't, I won't do that. Um, the first one is relentless improvement. 
Now, anybody that knows what we do in Agility Health, you know that um, measuring and improving and, and using metrics and using data to inform what you're going to do and how you're gonna improve, that's like the heart and soul of what we do. Um, but it's, it's one of the predictive indicators of business agility and every company that we talk to right now, uh, there's been like this spike of, we need to know where we are. We need to use data to make informed decisions. Uh, we need to start experimenting. Um, even when we're doing outcome-based planning, we wanna create hypothesis statement and key results and metrics and, 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 and experiment and learn because we believe that we don't know it all and that we consistently and constantly have to improve. So relentless improvement and continuous improvement and culture of learning and growth. I mean, there isn't a call that I'm on right now with a customer that that's not what we're talking about. So, so just keep that in the back of your mind is that this, you know, I know the path for the next one or two years, I can build a roadmap and execute against it without pausing to measure and learn. Um, that's, that's, just, that's not the way of the future anymore. The second one is the, the, the big word, here it comes, it's the big V word value streams, right? Value streams is so funny. Just today, really senior executive at very senior, um, uh, very big financial firm said, I, I think that word is overloaded. Everybody uses it in different ways. I don't want to use it. And I said, okay, no problem. We'll use cross-functional teams aligned to value. Does that work for you? Yes. Okay, great. Awesome. The concept of value streams um, is a predictive indicator for business agility. Whether you like the term, you don't like the term, it doesn't matter. What are we talking about? We are saying we don't care about the hierarchy. We don't care about who reports to who. You've got these business outcomes. You've got these goals you're trying to accomplish. Who are all of the right teams that need to align to that? And how, and how can you design teams and organize them around value in a logical way, in a virtual way? Uh, so, so just begin to think about that if you're not already moving in that direction. Many of you, you know, I'm sure you are um, because every company we talk to again right now is working actively on their team design and optimizing cross-functional team design around value. And again, when we say that, we're not just talking about technology, we're talking about technology and business and all of the right groups and finance and legal that need to integrate together to deliver value. So value isn't just technology delivery value. And then the last one is my favorite. Um, it's the funding models. Uh, so it's us shifting to funding outcomes and stable teams and moving away from project-based funding, right? So, I mean, again, everybody who's talking to anybody right now is saying, we don't want to be projects anymore. We want to move to products. And I think Evan must have a book or, or something on this too. <laughs> I know Mick has a, Mick from Tastop has a great book. There's so many, but your, uh, what is your hashtag? No projects. Hashtag no projects. Hashtag no projects, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's a very big deal, but what are we really saying, you guys? What are we really saying? We, we're saying we want stability, we want stable teams that are going to be aligned. We wanna fund these stable teams and we wanna measure and, and fund the value based on outcomes. Um, and so the shift to outcomes is very real. Just like business agility is real. Everybody I talk to is talking about outcomes, but I will tell you just from somebody who's been doing outcomes for many years, teaching customers that it's hard, you're going to think that you got it. And two years later, you'll still realize you're still practicing and learning how to write better outcomes. Uh, and the example I always give is when all of us, you know, we're trying to learn how to write stories and everybody either ended up writing a task or an, or an epic or a feature. Like we just either went too big or too small and we couldn't get it quite right. So, but start, start your journey towards outcome-based planning and then aligning the work to outcomes. What you don't want to do is um, lipstick on the pig outcome planning. Let me tell you what that looks like. You take your list of 300 deliverables that are there today and you change them all into the OKR format. And you're like, yay, look at my list. I had 300 deliverables. They're now transformed to 300 OKRs, so I must be on the right track. No, that's not the point. The point of shifting your funding model to outcome base is that you are funding outcomes as in your strategy. What is your strategy? What are you trying to accomplish in the market? How will you win, right? That's what Evan's been talking about. How am I gonna win in this market? And, what, and how will I see my lagging indicators and my leading indicators to get me there? And then what's the absolute minimum amount of work that I need to fund to get me there? Not what's the 300 projects and how do I put lipstick on them and call them OKRs? So that's just my two cents that I wanted to mention around the predictive indicators. Uh, definitely awesome to see them and awesome to see them repeat themselves. Um, so I'm gonna put a plug for the upcoming report that Evan and I are also working on. And this is, we just did um, some research and analyzed data and agility health across 47,000 team members um, to understand what predicts performance. What are those 
qualitative maturity metrics that predict performance. But one of the interesting insights that came out that I just wanna share with you is we were able to figure out what predicts happiness and what drives happiness within the team. Uh, and what was really cool is the number one predictor of team happiness was, what do you guys think it would be? Self-organization. Self-organization, which is the team's ability to make decisions, to be empowered, uh, to uh, be enabled to, to make decisions at the team level, to be creative and, and, and find their own solutions. And I was just really happy to see that, uh, that that was the number one predictor of team happiness was self-organization. Because now when I talk to managers about let off the command and control, you know, enable self-organizing teams, I can show with data that that, you know, impacts team happiness. And of course, uh, team happiness and, 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 and overall team health is a leading indicator for team performance and team performance is a leading indicator of outcomes. So that's how we tie it all to business agility. The second one um, was actually clarity on roles and expectation. So the second uh, predictor of team happiness was clarity on roles. So knowing what I need to get done uh, and knowing what's expected of me and what's expected of other people. So it's not just me, but others was the second one. So just wanted to give you guys a couple of teasers for the upcoming report. Uh, but very excited to hear your feedback, your comments, your questions, and I'm going to hand it over now to Martin. Fantastic. Thanks, Sally. And I will share a few slides because I'll be taking you through the key findings from the report. And I find that a few diagrams really helps for that. So first, a thumbs up that sharing is happening. Yes. All right. So um, who am I? Well, I'm Martin Foster, a senior consultant at TeamForm. And why am I here? Well, TeamForm is primarily focused on a tool of the same name, but for the past six years, my main work has been getting on the ground and helping large 50 plus thousand person organizations with the implementation of their agile ways of working. Um, in 2018, I ran into Evan at one of the great Business Agility Institute meetups where he mentioned he was working on the first edition of this report uh, and offered our help with the data analysis and assistance in writing out the results. So since then, it's been sort of our way of giving back to the agile community. Um, in 2019, we went a step further and partnered with the Neurotech Institute, um, who have come in and helped, I guess, provide impartial and high quality uh, assistance with the data analysis and the stats that underpin the report. So Sally has already taken us through the key, three key predictive indicators, but the one thing I want to add on to this is that, that they showed up with three years in a row is like the gold standard for social sciences research and the stuff, I guess, the, the content behind this report. Um, so it's super encouraging and we look forward to seeing what shows up next year and hopefully that will persist. Um, so taking a bit of a closer look uh, into factors of high performing organizations uh, from the report. So company size. Well, in the business agility space, it's long been a hypothesis that smaller organizations are more agile than larger ones. And the survey data supports this. Uh, it was further mentioned that smaller companies benefit in the measures of growth mindset and people management. So smaller is more personable, right? So in 2021, we wanted to have a closer look at this relationship between the company size and business agility. And it turns out that there's a sweet spot or agility plateau, I guess, uh, related to about the 200 person mark. After that, the average scores start to reduce. That's encouraging because it's close to Dunbar's number of the approximately 150 or so people that an average person can keep a higher trusting relationship with. In other words, your tribe. Um, it's also interesting to note that the measures of board agility and overall workforce agility were not impacted by company size. So it sort of remains stable regardless of the size of the organization. So what can you do if your organization is larger? My suggestion is to where possible, keep the number of people working at a given value stream to a maximum of about 200. And for two 10,000 plus person organizations, well, for those that have been paying attention in 2020 and 2021, there's a small uptick that we've seen emerge in the average maturity scores of large 10,000 plus person organizations versus that 200 to 10,000 mark. So we don't yet understand why this is happening, but it's kind of neat because it's counterintuitive. So we'll be keeping an eye on that in the years to come in hopes of better understanding what's going on there. So talking about time on journey. One of the questions that I get asked a lot, and I understand a lot of other practitioners too, is, hey, I'm going to invest in change. When can I expect to see benefits from this agile transformation? In the past years, we were able to say that organizations that were eight or more years into their journey scored much better than those that were less than a year in. That sounds kind of intuitive. So in 2021, we wanted to look further into that time on journey factor 
And we found that significant benefits start to show up after about two years on during. And then the next big significant tick is eight plus years in, which is kind of what this graph is trying to tell you. For an idea of scale and the number of respondents coming back to us, there's also, I guess, over half of the respondents to the survey have been doing this for more than two years. So it's not just a small percentage of the responses here. So this is super encouraging because many agility journeys take six to 18 months to get started and run their first few learning iterations. If you're in doubt and if you haven't started yet, there's no better time than now. A couple other neat factoids that have come out about high performing organizations in this space. First, their change programs tend to be led from the board. That's not to say that they didn't start small, but rather that higher performing ones eventually need leadership from the top. A frequent challenge, which we'll discuss shortly, is lack of support from the upper management echelons. The second factor that we've seen pop out is that higher performing organizations tend to transform multiple business functions at once. Sally touched on this a little bit. So where change programs are focused on just one function, say technology, they didn't fare quite as well as the ones that transform many because that could cross a value stream. There's something specific and important to note about technology or IT functions. Respondents tell us that they're included in 70% of transformation journeys, but also that they underwhelm again when they're the only part of the organization that's changing. In other words, I think we noticed this a few times where you can get a very nimble technology organization that's been limited by what it can do because it bumps into the rest of the business that's operating in a legacy way of working. So um, COVID-19. As Evan said, we can't overlook this. 2020 and 2021, it's impossible to like sort of skip by what it's done to business agility. This year, to try to get even further insights into what's happened, we sent a subset of respondents a short questionnaire to learn more about the pandemic impact of a specific industry and their business's response. So together with the main survey data, we learned a few neat things. First, no respondent indicated that their market was predictable. Volatility was absolutely everywhere. That's a big change from the past where we had some industries saying, yep, our world is predictable, not, not in 2021. But also that the high performers, so the people that are rated had a high, with a high average mature, business, mature, business agility maturity score, also tended to indicate that they coped a lot better with this market volatility, a benefit of investing and doing well in your journey. However, respondents confirmed that regardless of the type of organization or their maturity rating, they found that overwhelmingly rapid change was generally seen as both possible and beneficial. This builds on last year's observations that as the pandemic hit, organizations tended to have much more clarity on what was important. This allowed us to, you know, allowed a much faster shift to the highest priority work versus what was possible in pre-pandemic times. Often cited as evidence of this in the commentary was the speed with which remote working was enabled and how quickly products and the delivery were adapted to changing market demand. The corollary to this is that more leaders got clarity on what wasn't a priority. So this takes a lot into what Sally was just taking us through, that you could actually go in there and stop the lower priority work so you can focus on the more important stuff. So not end up with a list of 300 that you're trying to execute at the same time. What's more, respondents told us that they believe the pandemic induced changes were sustainable. Given the duration of the pandemic and ongoing expected market volatility, nobody expected their organization to snap back to the, things, the way things were in late 2019. Lastly, respondents tended to indicate that as a result of the pandemic, there was renewed interest, emphasis, and funding allocated to their transformation. So looking beyond COVID, each year we asked respondents to tell us about the top challenges they face on their business agility journey, as well as the benefits. For 2021, resistance to change rise as the top challenge. In the qualitative commentary, it was linked to unsuitable organizational structures that made it harder to reorganize people into cross-functional teams working in customer-aligned value streams. Sound familiar? A recommendation to overcome this challenge is to keep reminding people why reorganization is happening and to best focus uh, so they can best focus on the most important products, for example, and so that company can survive COVID-related market disruption. Find your reason why, repeat it, repeat it again. The second most frequently cited challenge was with leadership. We touched on this a bit earlier when discussing, or sorry, we, this sort of kicks in a bit there when discussing the three predictive indicators, um, but the respondents often cited mindset challenges and lack of clear vision. An example of this is leaders not following the new ways of working that are being asked of the rest of the staff. Thirdly, respondents indicated that they were facing difficulty scaling their agile transformation. Related to this was mention of a shortage of skilled personnel, often engineers, coaches, experienced front masters, and facing inflexible fixed or fixed funding models. So again, the key three key predictors do well on those help overcome these challenges. 
the report offers more recommendations on how to overcome this also worth read. What's encouraging about seeing resistance to change and difficulty scaling reported so frequently this year is that these tend to be challenges faced later in a business agility journey. It relates nicely to the fact that most respondents have been doing this for more than two years now, confirming that more organizations are undertaking a journey and sticking to it. Looking to close on a high, let's look at the most often cited benefits of agility transformations. Again, remembering that most people have been doing this for more than two years, so they're in that you know, benefit realization curve, if you will. For 2021, speed to market was the most often reported benefit. Um, it represents a significant jump up from the past years and is singled out as being key to many organizations' response and survival to COVID-induced changes. The second most often reported benefit was employee satisfaction. And this had a few different flavors. The first one was a pandemic flavor. So the ability to better support staff and coworkers in challenging times. And it called out the satisfaction that comes when friction to getting stuff done is reduced. So by reducing hand, handoffs and obstacles to change, it's just more fun to do work when you can get it done. Employee satisfaction is also quite important to staff retention, a key call out this year that's seen much average, um, much higher than average to employee turnover rates of some factor that The Economist magazine has been calling out across the world. Thirdly, respondents noted benefits in adaptability. This is an interesting sentiment um, as the adaptability this year was applied to the whole organization, whereas previously they just focused on like leadership adaptability. Adaptability supports the continuous improvement of practices, production of silos, and ultimately counters, helps to counter resistance to change. This year, we also have an honorable mention. So while we're not doing this for money or for revenues, it's the first time that financial benefits started to be repeatedly called out in responses to, in responses to the survey. We're gonna keep a close eye on this one in years to come as direct financial rewards do tend to be a good thing for organizations and also get the help to get the laggards on board with the change. So um, this completes my walk through the key findings for 2021. There's a ton more detail on the report, so I can only encourage you to give it a read. For those that want to take a deeper, a deeper look at the methods and results from the survey data, these are also made available for review in collaboration with the Neurotech Institute, who again are responsible for the report's underlying data analysis, uh, because we want that to remain independent and a very high standard. A quick plug for Team Form ourselves, who are we? Um, I guess years ago in our agile consulting work, we noticed that organizations who were standing up cross-functional teams didn't have a consistent process or tool to plan, form, manage these teams in an ongoing way. It needed to be done ad hoc, and it was often on slides and spreadsheets that quickly got out of date. So we built Team Form to solve this. Once you know who your teams are, you can clearly communicate the business outcomes they're working on, show the benefits of investing in relentless improvement, and build out adaptive funding models to persistently fund them. So if you'd like to learn more about them, please have a look at our site or reach out to me directly. Thanks for that. Back to you, Evan or Trish or whoever is going next. All right. Thank you, Martin. All right. So as you saw, we have a lot of great insights in the report. There's more than we could cover in, in the 30 minutes of, of going through the, the key findings. This is your chance now to ask questions. Um, and uh, so please take a moment, add them into the chat, add them into the Q&A, and we'll take time to answer them. First of all, I do want to, however, touch on something that Andrew has mentioned in the chat around this resistance to change. Um, agility doesn't suit us, we're unique, and it's not adaptable. This is a common theme. So not so much a question as a statement, yes, but if I can just add to that, one of the... One of the reasons we exist as an organization is so that I never hear those words again. I don't want someone to say, oh, that won't work here. And throughout my career, I've heard that way too many times. So we've been publishing case studies and references from pretty much every single industry and sector. Uh, we published a paper on business agility in the mining sector. And for those of you who have ever worked in mines or in the mining sector, they don't have customers. They sell to exchanges. So customer centricity is a very different concept for them. But they can, but yes, agility is still important. Literally yesterday, I had a call with the owner of a Dubai construction firm. Like they're building like skyscrapers. And the construction industry right now is completely being um, uh completely decimated by um, COVID-19. There's no new construction. They're finishing what they're doing and there's just no money. So 
we had a very long conversation about what does agility in the construction se sector looks like. And again, we're building out some stories and some case studies about what they're doing and how they're doing it. So agility is behaviors. It's a way of acting. It's a way of being. It's not a specific set of practices. Uh, beyond budgeting or throughput accounting may not work for your organization, but the concepts of adaptive finance, as we know from uh, the, the research being one of the key predictive indicators, are valid. And so, yes, it's organizations are unique and that is important to recognize, but it doesn't mean that agility is not possible or not important in your organization. So uh, yes, empiricism does really help there. <laughs> are you um, ready for the first set of questions? Go nuts. Trisha, yes, thank you. Sure. So the first question that we had that came in is changing to focus on value streams can seem daunting, especially considering they're end-to-end -end and cross-functional by nature. What can the team or the individuals do from a practical perspective to shift to outcomes and the value streams that deliver them? I started to type an answer, so I'm curious to hear what others have, but just my what I started to type over here is... Um, it is true, trying to design value streams from the bottom up is, is, is difficult, but if, if I had to give any guidance there, it would be every time the team or this product group or whoever they're working with finds another team that they depend on, uh, it doesn't matter what they are, business or technology, try to influence bringing them into your normal planning cadence and being able to work with them directly and to engage with them. Um, you're slowly removing the dependencies and slowly, regardless of, you know, uh, if they're business or technology or finance or HR, bringing them into the fold so you can work together. So I would almost say just break, break dependencies one at a time um, and bring people into the fold, especially if they are aligned to the same outcome. And please define your outcomes in a way that is holistic and, and a business outcome as opposed to the technology product delivery outcome versus the business, you know, because I've also seen those versions of outcomes where they're uh, you know, some of them are very output oriented and almost designed just for the tech team to deliver them. So I don't know if Evan or Martin want to jump in here on how can teams uh, slowly design value streams aligned to outcomes. I'd like to add to that. Um, not so much a how, but just why. Um, there's a really good case study in our library from DBS Bank in Singapore, where they, excuse me, where they we're undergoing an organizational transformation uh, and actually have been for a long time. They're probably one of the more, um, they're not perfect, no organization is, but they're definitely one of the more advanced business agility transformations in Southeast Asia, not the most advanced transformation in Southeast Asia. Um, when they started adopting, they went through a process improvement process and they started with, I think it was like the lost credit card process. And they spoke to customers, they went through ethnographic research, they, they tried to figure out what it was that, uh, how they could improve their customer satisfaction scores. And so they got their lost credit card process down from like, I think it was like three or four days down to one day. Um, they listened to customers, they made the help desk more human. So the help desk was no longer a, um, give me your name, rank, and serial number, but it was more, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, have, you, have you reported to the police? Here's some links to help you. And by the way, I do need your name, rank, and serial number before we proceed, All right? So even the help desk became more humane. And then after they optimized this process, they called a customer and they said, hey, you've just been through the new lost credit card process. What do you think? And the response was something along the lines of, it's great, where's my debit card? Because it wasn't enough the customer hadn't lost a credit card. They'd lost their wallet. And this, the way that banks work, obviously you, you've got these lines of business, credit and core banking and so, so forth. And never the twain shall meet. The customer doesn't care about your internal structure. The customer cares that they've lost their wallet. So that experience point for the customer had nothing to do with the credit card, had everything to do with, losing that wallet and everything that was associated with that. And so this looking at it from the, from a value stream, it's about the customer view of value, not how you perceive value inside your organization. 
Awesome. Thank you, Evan and Sally. Go ahead, Martin. I was going to add for teams that are actually in the value stream or like, you know, facing directly with customers or close by. Um, another thing you can look at is what's getting in the way of helping that customer. Because uh, often finding out those impediments or the things that are slowing things down, like handoffs to other teams, is a nice starting point for trying to bring in the different functions, the different capabilities. Uh, again, focus on you know, the overall banking experience, not just the linear part. Great. Our next question um, is very interesting. I'm excited for this answer. The understanding of the customer, is it a cause or a consequence of the business agility? I'll, I'll start again. Um, both. <laughs> I say both. I, I think that you have to start. Um, business agility is nothing without the customer at the center. So I think Evan uh, in, the, in the business agility model draws, draws that pretty clearly that when you when you see the picture of the domains of business agility like the customer is like at the center so it all starts with a focus on who is the customer what do they need and and how can we even you know how, how can we even create a future uh by anticipating their needs in the future but i think the more business agility you adopt the more you learn from the customer so i think it's both it's kind of an input almost a predictor for business agility and also a consequence of business agility I would agree. The only thing I'd add, so there's the domains of business agility for those who've not seen it before. And so the customer is right there at the center if my camera is going to focus properly. Um, the only thing I'll add is customer centricity is the domain that has the fastest return on investment in terms of maturity and benefits, um, much more so than things like structural agility, like organizational restructure, which is definitely one of the, the slowest to get an ROI. Um, so Sally's right, it's both, um, but it also should be first, <laughs> definitely in terms of ROI. Trisha? Awesome. Um, our next question is, do we have any experience with business agility in schools? Um, if possible, can we share the name of the customer and what are their value streams? So I can answer this. <laughs> um, so uh sort of so if you're familiar there are some frameworks like edu scrum which exist there's also a book called agile faculty uh which is about using agile it is about universities not about tertiary uh it's about primary and secondary um but they are uh so agile faculty is about using an agile practices in curriculum development and and running a faculty that's by rebecca rebecca pope rewalk if i remember that correctly um, but Google will get you the correct details. Um, there's also an organization for those of you in America called America Succeeds. They're one of our members. America Succeeds is a not-for-profit that is running a program called like the Age of Agility, no relation to Steve Denning's book, um, for schools. And it's about how do you teach an agile mindset to students? And I will note that they were talking... They didn't actually know about agile from a technology or business agility standpoint. They were, they came up with that phrase completely independently and then they discovered our community. So it was a really interesting conversation as we kind of like, like saw where they were coming from and where, where they were developing in terms of these growth mindsets and this adaptability. And for them, the perspective is about how students, students need to learn how to learn. They need to learn how to be adaptable because the skills you learn at school uh, certainly once you're getting to like year 10, 11, 12, um, are actually not that helpful because it, it's the work environment changes so quickly these days. So it's, it's, there's a lot of things happening. Um, there's a school, uh, uh, Sally, Trisha, is it Hope, Hope School? The Scrum Alliance case study. Um, I think oh, I'd have to go look it up. I think it is Hope though. Yeah, so there's a so it's Hope School or something. It's a Scrum Alliance case study on using agile practices in a school. Um, so the answer is kind of sporadically here and there. Um, as an industry, it's only just really getting started. Evan, are you ready for some questions within the report itself? Since you sent it out, people have have gotten into it already, and so they've got some questions. That's awesome. Uh, Perfect. Um, and Martin will need your help here too. Any idea why North America is not doing quote unquote 
better than other continents. If they're assumed to be the most innovative companies in the world, or maybe not, um, is it because of old leadership style or is there another reason why they've not improved on agility more than they have? So that's a great pickup because when we had conversations with Evan about this, one of his hypotheses was that, hey, North America will probably do better than the rest of the world for exactly the same reasoning. Um, and this was true in the data uh, in 2018 and 2019, but uh, 2020, 2021, potentially related to the pandemic, it's not. Uh, however, in the commentary or anything else we pick up, there's no clear indication of why. So that's something that we'll actually have to keep a little bit of an eye on because I can't. You, you picked up a correct trend in the past four years, but I can't quite explain it. So let me give you an opinion. Right? And, and this is just an opinion. There's, there's no data in what I'm about to say. Right? So I'll just, I'll just caveat that. Right? I'm wrong. Um, if I look at how Australia or Singapore address the pandemic, um, in both cases, we went into heavy lockdowns. There was very strict uh, rules and regulations, all public health, and I'm not going to get into the, the politics of who's right and who's wrong. Right? Uh, and I know that's a, in America, that's a political sensitivity, right? but it did happen. So what that meant was organizations were forced to adapt. There was no pretense of business as usual. There was no way for an organization to, to, to try and act as normal, right? just because of those very, very strict lockdowns and so forth. America didn't have that national approach throughout 2020 and 2021. Some states definitely did, um, but not at a, the, the external trigger for adaptability wasn't as strong as it was for the rest of the world or many other regions in the world. Again, these are all, there's some subjectivity to this as well. Um, so I believe, I guess, I have no data for what I'm saying. It's something to do with that rather than anything else. Sally, um, as an American, That's I'm interested in- a hypothesis too. This is again, just a hypothesis, right? Just totally, yeah. <laughs> totally hypothesis, but um, I don't know. I mean, this is again a hypothesis. I feel like the the the, com the companies that are outside the United States have more of an appetite of risk taking and and even competing with companies in the U.S. I think some of the companies in the U.S., especially the large ones, have gotten comfortable or think that they have arrived or, and at least I mean nobody thinks that way now. But I think that um, speaking to business and executives today compared to speaking to them before. Uh, the pandemic, I definitely felt at the executive level an appetite to experiment and try and do smaller things, but not like take big risks that are bold. Uh, now everybody's on the, you know, I think this metric is going to be interesting next year. I'd like to see uh, next year what happens with the U.S. Uh, now that sort of we lit a fire underneath them. Uh, but I, but I, there's something about risk taking and um, compliance and all the stuff that's happened before. There was almost like a hesitancy to do big, bad, bold things too quickly. And business agility requires some of that. Uh, and I've seen that tone shift suddenly when speaking to executives. While I feel like the rest of the world, because the big, you know, the big companies are here. Not all of them, but many of them are open and eager and hungry to compete and to thrive and to try new things. I mean, I look at a country, developing country like Sudan and some of the companies that are there are doing very modern, quick things. You know what I mean? And like, you know, uh, using drones for delivery of medical supplies and things. I'm like, well, I've never even, you know, they use their phone to pay for everything. I mean, I, I was surprised at how I would say even more advanced they were in some of the things that they were trying to do. But I think there was a lot of hunger and eagerness and risk taking. It's just a hypothesis. I think it's a good word. Uh, it's, 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 I would, we have a community in Indonesia uh, and obviously I'm talking now pre pandemic, but they were trying to leap forward 20 years of organizational development in, in two years. Uh, it's, they were one of the most active communities that we had um, because they were hungry. Right? They were trying to compete with America. They were trying to compete with Australia and they were leapfrog. They were just trying to leapfrog like the 90s and the 2000s in terms of organization development. Uh, it's, it's think of it as an enabling, they have constraints, but they're enabling constraints because uh, it allows them to be creative and allows them to be innovative. Awesome. Okay, let's turn to page 15 of the report. 
<laughs> the percentages from each column on the graph seem to be mutually exclusive. Um, Martin or Evan, could you explain what they mean? For example, finance, 25% uh, others, 30%, et cetera. And I don't have the report in front of me, so I can't refer to the additional numbers. So what this means is when we asked organizations, hey, which business function or capability is included in your agility transformation program? Um, this is what people responded. So when I said earlier on that technology was included most of the time, that's the 70 ish percent that's here. Um, so you'll have like, you know, only 31% included sales and marketing and their multi the multifunction um, that was involved in agile transformation. So that's what this means. From, and they can select yeah, more than yeah, one, yeah. which is why the percentage is out yes. more than 100%. Some selected all, some selected just one and everything in between. Wonderful. Thank you for explaining that. Um, when it comes to best practices to identify, address, and resolve perceived barriers to agile adoption from the 21 report, are there particular themes that arise and practical strategies to overcome them? Well, in part, that's the, the top challenges that people identify. So we talk about like the, the top three, resistance to change, um, leadership, uh, difficulty scaling. But on page 21, the, the top 10 are stacked in there. So I guess we have the, the report offers a few suggestions, I guess, picked up from practitioners as to how you can overcome or potentially help shift the needle on the top three. There was, a, specifics. There, was, there was a quote from John, Jonathan Smart. I'm trying to remember it. I think it was on the first page. He says that impediments are the path. They're not an obstacle. What it, can anybody remember that quote for me? I just love that. It was, yeah, it's, it's definitely in this book too. Yeah, impediments are the path, like you. Right. So the impediments themselves are the path to business agility, not an impediment to business agility. Because he said basically, if you want to achieve business agility, just go find one impediment, next impediment, next roadblock, you know, next dependency, uh, next bottleneck, next, you know, and basically use the impediments as the path to business agility and just unblock them, unblock them. Yeah, the, the, there you go, Nadia, Nadia said the obstacle, yeah, the obstacle, the impediments is the way. So I just thought that was kind of cool. Outstanding. Sally, this one is really, I think, very much in your wheelhouse. For large mm -hmm. companies, how efficient is it to adopt the use of the OKR method in just one unit as opposed to use it for the whole organization? Sure. I mean, I, I think you start where you can. Um, uh, to be honest with you, if the one unit is not a cross-functional unit, and they're just going to go off on a silo and deliver siloed kind of outcomes. Then it, that's not going to that's not going to be. I mean, again, that's like similar to, you know, we're a functional unit, um, and we're just going to create functional outcomes for our functional area. That's not. And, and I actually had an executive from a large financial just tell me that today that she's so worried that people are going to leave. We're doing an upcoming webinar for her leadership team that they're going to go try to build OKRs in their functional silo. And she said how do we keep using the word cross-functional in front of everything that we're doing so that they know that the goals and the outcomes that they come up with have to be cross, uh, cross, uh, you know, cross department, cross organization. So if this line of business is truly a line of business, like the commercial or like the mortgage area, so truly a business line of business, of course they can start to adopt OKR and outcomes um, within that area, as long as they're gonna align, you know, all the right teams. But if it's a functional, uh, group, I would say no, I, I wouldn't adopt outcomes until I find um, the right cross functional groups and, and create more business. I don't know if Evan, if you have anything to say here as well. So I think you covered it fairly well. The only thing I'd add is it's the old saying you get the behavior that you measure and changing, changing how organizations measure teams as well as individuals is gonna be a critical part, an early part of any kind of organizational change. Um, I know there's a, a, a decent collection here from Melbourne. And if you remember the, uh, for those of you who aren't from Australia, we had a Royal Commission into the banking sector a couple of years ago. And the big finding was, well, perhaps of, of limited surprise, but that the bankers were generally doing naughty things, um, opening bank accounts in the names of, of uh, old ladies and old men, uh, in some cases, even people who were deceased. Uh, and 
the most egregious of these behaviors were can basically be brought down to how these people were incentivized and measured. And they weren't being measured on the customer. They weren't being measured on impact or benefit. They were being measured on how many bank accounts have you opened today? Right? And it led to this behavior, uh, to be blunt, this fairly disgraceful behavior. Uh, and our banking industry is only just sort of just recovering from that now. Um, so it's, I'll reiterate something that Sally st said, which is just, you have to start somewhere <laughs> and just change those behaviors. And you'll do that by, in many cases, changing the measures. Kat, you uh, share the same thing. I think the Australian bankers learned that from some of the US bankers. So it seems to be a bit of a global, global problem. <laughs> um, Martin, I actually had a question for you, if you don't mind. So you shared that significant benefits of, of Agile start to show up in the ROI at year two, and then yep. again at year eight. So how do we keep the momentum going in those years three to seven when it seems to plateau a little bit and, and leaders are saying, what are the benefits of continuing on this path? Well, that's a great question. Yeah, so we really originally wanted to focus on like how long do I have to invest to you know, start to see that statistically significant uptick. Um, I guess what we're hoping is, or my hope would be, that once you're started and once you start to see the benefits, then it's sort of like a self-fulfilling nurturing prophecy, right? Like the investment goes in and you can see like people can give you direct feedback that it's going well or not. And they get that sense, you know, the ability to continuously improve and fix the challenges so that the longer term business agility, I guess, while it's important, it doesn't become like front and center in people's minds as we must see benefit or else we'll stop. Um, yeah. Does that help answer that question? It does. I think it's, started, it's start to see benefits in the avalanche continues, hopefully. Yes, I think it's difficult sometimes for organizations to say, okay, we're going to see benefit from this all the time, all the time, all the time. And so to keep that engine running and, and to keep to keep the momentum going, sometimes it, we all need help to, to keep everybody on the path, even if they're not seeing what they expect to see from a traditional ROI perspective. This is true. And then one of, one of the questions that we get asked a lot, Sally and I, when we talk with leaders is, how do we even get started? Because sometimes these efforts can be daunting. So I, I'd love to get feedback from you and from Evan and, and from Sally as well that we can share with our audience. I think just there, um, you know, while the more successful transformator, you know, programs tend to involve like leadership from the top, um, we get a lot of evidence that they do start small. Like somebody notices the problem, you know, they're within a team, a few teams, whatever, a division, um, and they get going there. And then they use that sort of as the proof point, the front running point to say, hey, wouldn't it be great now that we see that we're getting resistance from, you know, it's harder to interact with sales. It's harder to get cooperation from finance. How we want to fund this, they sort of start to pull it in and you reach this critical mass where it sort of gets pushed up to the top. But yeah, you have to start with one specific problem that is hard to solve otherwise. I'm going to go through the ads. Yeah, oh, sorry. sorry. So, Sally, go. Just, I do a lot of the, the top-down business agility. So unfortunately, you know, companies come to us because they're ready to, to do a change and then like give us the path. So we always start with, we say step number one is education and awareness. Um, that video that I just posted is one of our videos that we use the explainer. So we like to educate people. What is business agility and, and how do you get to it? And what problems are you trying to solve? And that generating of the excitement and, and honestly taking the word away from agile to, you know, enterprise business agility and, because some people kind of interwine those words and then it creates lots of confusion um, because I think agile is a piece of business agility and enterprise, biz enterprise business agility, but it's not the thing. It's so I think just clarifying and, and using the right terms when you're talking to executives. Um, and then we, you know, after the education awareness, we, we just, we do a, a baseline measurement of where you are today and then build a strategy and a roadmap and make sure that you've built a transformation team that's going to support this and that you've enabled them because it's not going to happen accidentally. Um, you do need an internal team to, to move forward. And then please, you know, think about Agile and that you would be using quarterly plans and quarterly execution to deliver whatever it is that you want to change internally. 
Um, but like Evan says, there isn't necessarily a framework, a checklist for what to do, but you can measure where you are and where you believe are your perceived bottlenecks and pain points. And what of these things do you want to improve on and adopt um, in your way? Definitely taking from whatever patterns have been shared um, in the public arena uh, or by other companies. So those would just be my you know, uh, education and awareness, measure and assess, uh, create a roadmap and then build a team. I'll just, uh, I think we're coming to the end of the webinar, so I'll just quickly add yes to everything that's been said, start with why. Right? It's, it, I think that's, I think that's been drilled into most of our community by this point. The only thing I'll add to it is find the constraint. Uh, it's trying the constraint to agility in your organization. Uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the constraint probably was your technology function because it would take years to bring a product to market. But today, uh, with most agile, capital A agile transformations have been running for a decade. You've got DevOps, you've got all these technology, technological improvements. So the constraint to agility isn't measured in how quickly you can deploy to production. Your constraint to agility is how quickly you can recruit the right person. It's how quickly you can adapt your strategy. It's um, how well you get customer and actually use customer feedback. Uh, there are other constraints in the system, in the organizational system. And so that's find the constraint and start there. And it's gonna be somewhat unique to your organization. There's, there's not a, a one size fits all organizational constraint pattern as much as I'd like to say that. Um, I think this is probably the point where we should say farewell. I want to say thank you to Martin. Thank you to Sally. Um, please check out Agility Health. Um, they have some really, really great uh, features or uh, functions as a tool when it comes to measurements uh, for organizations. Same with Teamform. I think Martin did a pretty good job of, uh, of, of sharing what Teamform is. Please check out the Business Agility Institute, the, the, the library. If you haven't read the report, um, you should have received it in an email a few hours ago. If you haven't, there will be another email coming out after this, again, with a link to the report, or you can download it from the Business Agility Institute website. Um, and I just want to take a moment to thank you for taking time out of your evening, day, morning, afternoon. I know at least one person here from Europe. I think it's like 1 a.m. for you, so I'm very impressed. So thank you all and have a wonderful, wonderful day ahead or evening. <laughs>